Okay, now I have the full permission from our uh, technical staff that we can start. And uh, I'll repeat that uh, we very much welcome everyone back to the ASEAN uh, Academic Days at Gimor University uh, for this autumn term of uh, this academic year. And we are very proud and happy and uh, honored to start uh, this set of uh, open lectures with uh, Dr. Ledin Tin's talk on uh, ASEAN's role in the contemporary geopolitical setting uh, at the regional and probably even global uh, level. Uh, Dr. Ledin Tin is the Director General of the Institute for Foreign Policy and Strategic Studies at the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, and also an author of uh, a numerous, uh, an, a number of uh, publications on Vietnam's foreign policy and regional uh, and regional security issues. We have students here with us uh, who study uh, the languages of East Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries. And also we are very happy that the representatives of uh, Vietnamese embassy to Moscow found uh, time and opportunity to join us. Uh, specifically, we are happy to welcome uh, Madam uh, Nam, uh, the minister counselor of the, of the embassy and her colleagues. Uh, and we have, uh, a huge number of participants who registered to participate online. Uh, so that's an incredible turnout. Uh, we are happy about that, but also a little bit terrified with their numbers. So uh, Dr. Ledintin, you might be bombarded with the Q&As. Um, but without much further ado, let me pass the floor to you. You have uh, up to one hour or, well, how many um, time do you need to present your topic? And then we will do a Q&A session to follow up. And the Q&A session will be managed by my colleague, uh, Ms. Daria Bacillo, with whom uh, you were in contact prior to the event. So. Please, uh, Dr. Ledentin, the floor is yours, and we are very much looking forward to listening to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ekaruna, and uh, my special thanks to the MGMO, um, you know, and the ASEAN Center uh, for having me. And uh, it's not a pleasure. I was, uh, you know, in Moscow, uh, 2018, and uh, I was astonished by you know the size of the city, uh, you know the greatness of Moscow and, and Russia. Uh, Majimo, in the uh, recent memories of mine, uh, you know, uh, is a place of dream for many Vietnamese, uh, including the Vietnamese diplomats and researchers in international relations. So it's such an honor for me to be here, and I will try to. Uh, makes the most of my time and uh, look forward to the Q&A section. Uh, first, let me uh, share the slide with you. Okay. Uh, can the host uh, enable my sharing uh, option? It still say disable participant. Yeah, just, just a moment, we will settle yeah, sure. it. Sure. So while we are waiting for the uh, the technical issue to be solved, uh, you know, is uh, I would like to uh, say this thing. So what I'm trying to say to you today is uh, just from my personal perspective, and I am no in no position to represent the perspectives or the views uh, of the Vietnamese government or the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Uh, rather, I will try to speak, uh, you know, just in my personal capacity and based on my research outcomes. Uh, so uh, so that for that reason, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's easier for me to uh, uh, share with you my, my research. Uh, are you seeing the screen now? Here, we can see it perfectly well, thank you. Wonderful. So let me start, okay? Um, you know, the, uh, the ASEAN Academic Days, uh, you know, promoted by the ASEAN Center, uh, I think is a very, uh, you know, uh, you know, a right step, uh, uh, you know, in the direction of promoting understanding 
about ASEAN. So I think this is a, a very uh, encouraging, a very welcome move uh, on the part of uh, your prestigious uh, academic institution. And I think it will be a good thing for a Russia-ASEAN partnership, uh, which I will talk a little bit later on. So my title uh, uh, for my presentation today is ASEAN in the Global Spotlight, Geostrategic Opportunities and Challenges. Um, I will try to cover three uh, major points uh, in my presentation. Um, point number one is I give you some pieces of the ASEAN history uh, because I think that it might be good for um, you know, uh, the audience to know a little bit more about ASEAN, particularly those who do not have the opportunity uh, to live in ASEAN, uh, you know, and face ASEAN and talk uh, to the ASEAN people and governments. So I will try to, in the first part of my presentation, uh, give you a very basic understanding of what ASEAN is and what ASEAN is doing. Okay, and in the second part, I will try to contextualize, you know, the ASEAN and the ASEAN story um, against the global backdrop, uh, you know, which is very fast changing right now. And, uh, you know, we see a lot of new, uh, you know, big developments uh, on the global stage. And uh, so I would like to see ASEAN, you know, against that background. And in the final and third part, in the final part, I uh, come to, uh, you know, uh, my, uh, you know, ordinary point of the importance of ASEAN, why ASEAN is still timely and why ASEAN is still relevant. And, uh, and I'm saying this because I want to mention at the very outset that I am an ASEANist, so I believe in the values of ASEAN, I believe in the ability of ASEAN in not just see things happen, but also make things happen, okay? So with that, I would like to uh, go to the first part of uh, my talk today. Uh, so, um, you know, ASEAN, in, you know, is comprised of 10 different members uh, in a vast area of a geographical area. So we have the mainland ASEAN and we have the maritime ASEAN and both of them are equally important, okay? So, um, you know, ASEAN membership is an issue that has been discussed uh, over the years. And the latest one is the, the you know, the uh, you know, possible inclusion of Timor-Leste in, into ASEAN. Uh, so if that is the case, then ASEAN will, you know, become an 11 member association. But for now, we are happy with a 10 member, you know, um, ASEAN association. And uh, like I said, you know, we are united in one association, but we are also very diverse, you know, geographically, culturally, and even politically. So that is the first point I'd like to mention to you. And, um, you know, we all know that the, the first five uh, founding members of ASEAN, including, uh, you know, Singapore, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, you know, um, Thailand, uh, and, and Singapore, and Malaysia. So those are the first, you know, members of, of, of ASEAN. Later on, uh, ASEAN uh, admitted Brunei in 1984 to become the sixth member. And then we have Vietnam, 1995. Um, you know, and following Vietnam uh, are Laos and, uh, and Myanmar and Cambodia. So uh, I would like to repeat this very critical piece of history of ASEAN. Um, ASEAN, you know, was one time an anti-communist organization, you know, because it was built upon the foundation of an organization that we, we know, uh, which is Seattle, okay? Seattle was basically very anti-communist and not friendly 
to a country like Vietnam. So the admission of, the, uh, of Vietnam into the association in 1995 marked a very important uh, milestone in the history of the association. You know, the association is now no longer an ideologically driven entity. You know, its agenda is broadened and deeper to include, uh, you know, different countries of different political stripes. So, um, you know, for that reason, ASEAN becomes such a diverse uh, organization. And this is uh, the organizational chart of the association. And as you can see, uh, ASEAN is, uh, you know, um, is an intergovernmental organization. Okay, ASEAN is not a supranational organization. There's no regional government standing above ASEAN to detect what the members should do and must do. Okay, so it's up to, you know, the member states you know, based on the consensus uh, principle, which I mentioned a little bit later on, uh, to drive the agenda of the association. So we are not a EU type, you know, model of regional organization. We are not the EU, okay? We are intergovernmental. And uh, so the organizational structure of ASEAN uh, is there, but not that, you know, uh, tight, not that, uh, you know, strictly, you know, structured or neatly organized uh, as other organizations, particularly uh, the European Union. We are not there, we are different. Um, so if I can say a couple of things about what ASEAN, ASEAN stands for and, and, and what are the values of ASEAN. Um, so I would say ASEAN is a peace loving organization ASEAN is designed to prevent wars and conflicts, first and foremost, between member countries, okay? ASEAN doesn't harbor any intention to cause any conflict or wage any war against any other country uh, in the world, you know? So peace is the guiding value of the association. And in the meantime, ASEAN wants to become a prosperous community Okay, by you know embarking on very ambitious uh, economic uh, you know uh, programs and projects among member countries and between ASEAN and partners, and of course ASEAN is designed uh, to be people centered. Okay, what ASEAN is trying to do is in fact to uh, you know uh, work for the interest of the ASEAN peoples. Yeah, so that is the. Uh, very important, um, you know, value uh, that I would like to mention. So I would like to summarize, uh, you know, the goal and the objectives of ASEAN uh, in the three Ps. ASEAN also has three Cs. And the first C is community. ASEAN, like I mentioned, is not trying to become a supranational organization but rather to become a community. So 2015, ASEAN was able to launch a, an ASEAN community, uh, you know, on the three key pillars of political security, uh, economic and commerce, and social and cultural. Okay, so that is the first C. The second one is connectivity. ASEAN is now, uh, you know, uh, implementing, you know, connectivity programs, the master plan of, on connectivity. Connectivity is here means people-to-people uh, -people connectivity, infrastructure connectivity, finance, um, financial trade economic connectivities, and regulation connectivities. So we try to harmonize laws and regulations among ASEAN member countries. And the last C is centrality. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, centrality in a moment, but centrality is basically the ASEAN uh, wish uh, to play central role 
in the construction of a regional security architecture. So ASEAN is trying to, you know, um, you know, to be in the driver's seat uh, of the, uh, you know, the security architecture building process in the Asia Pacific. Okay. And uh, I would like to mention this thing as well. You know, when we think about ASEAN, think the UN, okay? Because ASEAN is very much in line with what uh, the United Nations is trying to do. So in the ASEAN Charter, uh, we make a reference uh, to the UN Charter, okay? And that is why during the Vietnamese chairmanship of ASEAN last year, um, you know, Vietnam wants to have a stronger connection uh, between this regional body of ASEAN and the global governance body, which is the United Nations. So we try to increase the collaboration uh, between ASEAN and the UN. Okay, so that is a very important thing that I'd like to mention. So I will uh, skip the few slides, uh, the next few slides very quickly, because these are the things that are very basic. And I mentioned a bit earlier that the ASEAN community is, you know, rest uh, on the three pillars. And, uh, you know, uh, please bear in mind that ASEAN has a master plan on ASEAN connectivity. I mentioned this because I would like ASEAN partners, you know, to think about ASEAN as an organization, as a community that wants to promote, you know, its connection with the rest of the world, you know, including countries like Russia. Okay, so we are very open, we are very um, inclusive, and we want to connect with the rest of the world. So that is the um, first part of my presentation. I will move to the second part, uh, which is the contextual analysis. Uh, of the road of ASEAN. So, uh, you know, um, we are living in a time of great power competition. And uh, I am not talking about major power competition. I'm talking about great power competition, uh, particularly between the United States and China. You know, this is a, a fact that ASEAN has to uh, you know, uh, familiarize itself with. You know, the great power competition will produce tremendous impact on ASEAN, ASEAN unity, and what is ASEAN is trying to do. So that is a very important uh, part of the, the puzzle, of the global puzzle. The second uh, is that, um, you know, a few years ago, we will talk about the inevitability of globalization and free trade, you know, the world, you know, had become a, a village. That is no longer the case. You know, the world today has become a, a lot more fragmented. The world today has become a lot more divided than we imagined by a few years back, okay? So with the rise of populism, protectionism, you know, uh, you know, power politics, you name it. You know, the war has become, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more disunited than we imagined a few years ago. And, um, and it is, should be um, a missing link if we don't mention, you know, factors like the COVID-19 pandemic. And let me share with you this thing. The COVID-19 pandemic, in my view, will not be the last uh, pandemic that humankind will face. Uh, you know, the worst, you know, crises uh, will be ahead of us, okay? So there will be more black swans, there will be more green swans for us, you know? So that thing is a, a thing that we'd like to mention. And of course there are, you know, uh, mega trends like digitalization, um, you know, aging population, global warming, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, issues that are affecting uh, every walk of life, 
uh, including international relations. So these are the broader contexts uh, in which I see uh, the role of ASEAN. And this is the, uh, some of my uh, COVID-19 um, analysis. Uh, you know, the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, in my view, um, you know, uh, worsened some of the problems that we had before and also give us some opportunities. Okay, so, uh, so that is one way to look at the pandemic. Um, but for now, it is a very serious issue and um, we don't know uh, how we're gonna get out of it. Uh, but it looked like to me that uh, living with COVID uh, is now the popular choice uh, in, in, in policy, in the policy of different countries. Uh, you know, few countries in the world adopt a strategy uh, of what we call zero COVID. Uh, in ASEAN, we don't have any countries that adopt the strategy of zero COVID because that is impossible. Uh, impossible to get COVID, you know, totally out of our society. It is, uh, it is an uphill battle, okay? So, um, so, you know, governments in Asia, including Vietnam, is trying to uh, shift the gear a little bit uh, to be more flexible and to be uh, uh, more responsive, you know, rather than, uh, you know, adopting any radical measures to curb uh, the spread of this uh, virus. So that is the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And if you look at this chart, you know, we now have to adopt, uh, you know, the, the COVID impacted scenario. You know, we are we no longer, we couldn't afford anymore the non-COVID scenario. So, uh, you know, so the complication in national governance, in regional governance and global governance is increasing because the COVID-19 uh, is already a factor that we have to reckon with. Economically also, uh, you know, COVID-19, COVID uh, you know, creating, is creating a lot of problems economically. You know, both for, you know, for the economic growth, to the economic integration, and to the mega trend of globalization. And all of these things have been adversely impacted, uh, you know, with the emergence uh, of COVID-19. But like I mentioned earlier, the, the pandemic also gives some opportunities. You know, uh, time of troubles are also the time of change. You know, it's called the, the pandemic, um, uh, you know, cre creates impetus for national governments to, um, you know, uh, pursue uh, stronger reforms uh, and adopt more aggressive policy measures uh, to change, you know. And, um, it, you know, in the pandemic, ASEAN uh, governments understand that, you know, for in, in certain areas, um, you know, it would be an opportunity for them rather than a challenge. Uh, for example, in the area of digital economy, you know, cyber economy, uh, which is uh, growing very fast uh, under the impact of the pandemic. I would like to share this uh, chart with you as well. Um, uh, this was created by a very prominent Chinese scholar uh, by the name of Yan Sui Tong. And I know that many of you have been familiar uh, with him. So he draw this chart just to make a distinction uh, between the Cold War and the new Cold War, uh, you know, if I may. You know, so he argues that we are we do not have any cold war mentality these days. Instead, we have the digital mentality. Digital mentality is the name of the game, not cold war mentality. Forget about the cold war, you know? 
we don't have any other goal. World. The world is so different. And, uh, and uh, you know, the digital economy, for example, uh, is the area where most of the human wealth uh, is being created. You know, so uh, in the Cold War, the trade between the US and the Soviet Union uh, for one year is equivalent to the trade between the US and China just in one day. So the economic interdependence uh, between uh, you know, economies is hugely uh, you know, uh, different from what we saw before. And uh, for that reason, I often make this argument that the United States and China, they consider each other as strategic competitors but they don't see each other as adversaries because they need each other. You know, they need each other economically and they need each other for uh, transboundary issues uh, ranging from climate change uh, to pandemic. So that is a totally different, uh, you know, world that we uh, are witnessing. Let me uh, talk a little bit about Biden Definition foreign policy, uh, because this is a you know if you want to understand what ASEAN is trying to do, then we need to understand what ASEAN partners are trying to do, and one of the key actor here is the U.S. I don't have a lot of time to go into the Biden administration foreign policy, but let me say three things. Number one, there is a lot of continuity between Biden and Trump. Okay, so even though they have, they, you know, they embark on different measures, their goals are no different. Their goals are the same. And their goals is, the most important one is America first. You know, for Biden, the same thing, you know, America first. The United States under the Trump administration and the Biden administration very much now uh, look inward rather than look outward, okay? So domestic politics, domestic economic development, you know, consume most of the attention of any US president from now on. will consume their priorities and time and energy. So foreign policy, I think, you know, has to take a back seat, you know, in the policy of, of this country. The United States is still the most powerful country on earth, you know, with the size of the economy, with the power of the military and other sources of strength. But they are not able to do whatever they want to do. Uh, you know, they, you know, have to work with allies and partners and go back to uh, consolidate their, you know, uh, powers at home. Um, and um, let me uh, just give my analysis of, uh, of the way in which the Biden administration is approaching China. So if you look at the strategic guidance of the Biden administration, um, you can see that, uh, you know, there is a lot of more emphasis on the part of the Biden administration on the roles of allies and partners. And the latest example you might read from the news is AUKUS, right? They, they are trying to create, um, you know, uh, alliance and alliance variants like AUKUS and before that, we have the example of Quad. So this is the way that the United States is trying to, um, you know, uh, pursue pursue in the domain of, of foreign policy. They work more with allies and partners. Now let me uh, talk about the next uh, key actor, uh, which is China. Okay, so China is next to ASEAN 
and East Asia strategic partner. So um, it's important to understand, um, you know, China priorities, uh, China foreign policy at the moment. And uh, China under President Xi Jinping is pursuing what is known as the Chinese dream, okay? So the Chinese dream, what is the Chinese dream? Um, if you look at this map, you understand that, you know, China is a lot more powerful than China 20 years ago. Um, when China surpassed Japan to become the second biggest economy in the world in 2009, since 2009, Chinese, the Chinese economy has become three times bigger than the Japanese economy. Okay, so it's not just China is surpassing Japan, but leaving Japan far, far behind economically. So that is an example of how fast uh, China is growing economically. And if you look at all of this, um, you know, uh, Bell and Road Initiative um, uh, by China, you will understand China ambitions and China capability. The Bell and Road Initiative, according to the Chinese interpretation, has three big components. One is the land on land, Bell and Road. And the second is the maritime, time, uh, you know, Bell and Road. And the third one is the digital. Okay, so they have three components uh, on land, maritime, time, and digital. So that is a, an illustration of a, 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 of a, a different China that we witnessed, uh, you know, like a decade or two decades ago. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 10 years or 15 years, uh, China will replace the United States uh, to become the biggest economy um, in the world, uh, even though people are still discussing whether China will replace the US uh, economically uh, per se, because the, you know, the income per capita of China uh, is still um, you know, um, uh, a distance to go for China before it, it is able to catch up with the United States. But the size of the economy uh, will be bigger than the US. And there's nothing can stop China from doing so, okay? That's my guess. Uh, in the military field, uh, you know, um, both countries are, you know, you know, building up their military capabilities uh, very quickly, and you know, um, you know, not just uh, the in number, but also in quality. You know, the um, what makes the Chinese military uh, different is not only the quantity, but the quality. You know, you know much of the hardware, uh, you know, weapons uh, of the Chinese um, military of the PLA uh, is high tech. You know, they, they, are, they are catching up very quickly uh, in high tech military hardware. And, um, and not just hardware, but also military doctrine, um, you know, the organizational aspect of the PLA and, um, you know, uh, the investment, the, the expenditure uh, in the military, all of these areas are, you know, are changing and changing very quickly, uh, you know, um, to China's favor. Uh, so that, that is an, another illustration. So this is uh, the, co the competition between the US and China will be, uh, you know, um, a, a very big story that we have to follow, uh, including uh, in, in ASEAN capitals. Uh, but let me uh, say this thing before I move to the, the next part of my presentation. If I understand, um, you know, uh, the White House of the Biden administration correctly, then I think the U.S. strategy toward China 
is not about what China is doing. You know, their strategy will be what America is. In other words, instead of, you know, competing and, and tit for that or whatever the Biden administration uh, wants to do with China, they will choose a strategy that is aimed at our competing China by building the American power from inside out. So that is their strategy. So they will do what they do best, you know? Their strategy is not, you know, having a focus on what China is doing and what China is trying to do. So that is the thing that I, I would like to uh, emphasize, uh, you know, if we want to decode the American foreign policy under the Biden administration vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Let's put Russia into the equation. You know, it would be a mistake if we don't uh, include Russia in the calculation. So recently there has been, um, you know, the increasingly uh, people talk, you know, more about a new strategic triangle uh, between the US, China and Russia. Um, you know, I don't have time to go into the details here, uh, but, you know, in my view, Russia is a very important factor uh, to be reckoned with in the global power configuration. You know, if, if we analyze the global distribution of power and the global power configuration, we have to include Russia into that equation. Remember, during the Cold War, China is the weakest country in the Sino-Soviet Union, uh, you know, um, US-Soviet Union-China triangle relationship. But China still created a huge impact on the triangle, right, during the Cold War. So any of the country, whether that is the US, China, or Russia today, I think each of them can make tremendous impact uh, on the possible trajectory uh, of the power transition, power shifting, uh, you know, regional issues, global issues. Um, you know, so they are important. That's my point. And we have Quad and we have AUKUS, we have different uh, ways of uh, rallying forces, uh, you know, in the world right now. And if you look at this of uh, spaghetti bowl, you know, you're gonna see that uh, you know, um, there's no easy uh, route for any country to navigate uh, between these, you know, uh, complexities of, uh, of geopolitical complexities of our world today. But you don't have a choice. ASEAN doesn't have a choice. ASEAN has to live with the fact that, you know, the geopolitical context is becoming a lot more complicated and a lot more different compared to what happened during the Cold War or even five years or 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, ASEAN is now facing both the strategic opportunities and challenges in the domain of security, development, and international role. Let me go into a little bit of, uh, of more details about the impact of the global context on ASEAN. The first question is, way bono. Who will benefit, uh, you know, if ASEAN gets bogged down into the great power competition between the US and China? How ASEAN can emerge out of that competition being a winner? You know, so that is a very tough question for ASEAN right now, you know. We don't want to uh, get engaged with either the US or China and not knowing for sure, uh, you know, how can we, uh, you know, survive and uh, prosper, you know, given these uh, new developments uh, in the uh, competition between the US and China. 
uh, the second uh, issue that ASEAN has to answer um, and respond to is the question of, question of ASEAN centrality. So I don't think, for example, the same old opus operandi will work for ASEAN. ASEAN has to find new ways uh, to navigate uh, between uh, the US and China and between the global uh, geopolitical realities that I described earlier. So ASEAN has to change. There's no way that ASEAN can adopt uh, the same old uh, ways of uh, you know, operating. Uh, you know, so ASEAN centrality, I will talk a little bit more in the third part of my presentation. And you know, deep, by the end of the day, if you are in Hanoi or in Jakarta or Singapore or Kuala Lumpur or Manila, you have to think for yourself, which way you wanna go. You wanna go for the interest of the association or you pursue your selfish natural interests. You have to answer that question. And you know, the game is being played here, but we don't want to call it a game. Okay, ASEAN is one, and ASEAN is trying to uh, work for the benefits uh, of member states and for the association as a whole. So, you know, we have to put into the equation uh, what I uh, pushed the question mark there, and that's e equilibrium. You know, what is the point of balance, you know, for, for ASEAN and ASEAN member states? It's a very tough question. Uh, to answer. Now let me move to my uh, final part of my uh, the final part of my presentation, and in this one, I argue that you know ASEAN is still relevant despite all the challenges that I mentioned earlier. ASEAN is still working, and it should work, you know, for the interest of the region, and not just the region of the of South Asia, but also in the Asia Pacific. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of why I argue that you know ASEAN is still relevant. One, if we look at the region of South Asia right now, uh, we can say with a certain degree of confidence, you know, we are still peaceful and stable and secure. You know, there has been no war between ASEAN member states since its inception. You know, ASEAN doesn't love wars. ASEAN loves each other, <laughs> okay? So that is the um, a fact that we can be proud of. You know, there has been no conflict or war between ASEAN member states. Even though I mentioned uh, uh, on my, uh, in my slide, I pointed out on my slide that of course, there are small scale skirmishes between us and member states. But on balance, you know, on a grander scale, uh, you know, we are peaceful. Uh, second, you know, ASEAN is an economic opportunity. ASEAN is a market, uh, you know, of 600 million people, and the majority of it is becoming middle class. Um, and for that reason, ASEAN is becoming a lot more attractive uh, to its partners. So one example is the ASEP. You know, the ASEP is 47.5% uh, of the world population and 32% of the world economy. Uh, and uh, a few ASEAN member states are also signatories uh, to add the trade pact, such as the CPTPP. Uh, you know, the CPTPP um, is now so different uh, because um, with the, the United States withdrawal, but a few days ago, we also know that uh, China is trying to apply for a membership in this trade pact. And um, I don't know how the uh, members the signatories of uh, the CPTPP will respond to China request. Uh, but that, you know, again, you know, um, demonstrates 
the attractiveness of of uh, of the of the trade uh, arrangement. Um, and so ASEAN, you know, uh, like I mentioned, is a uh, is an provide a lot of uh, business opportunities and uh, for for partners. Uh, 2019, um, there was a survey and uh, by Baker and McKenzie. And this survey uh, uh, shows that South Asia is still the most attractive, uh, you know, geographical area in the world in terms of uh, providing opportunities for the international business uh, to do either their investment or, or M&A, you know? So that is another example of, um, of the economic, uh, um, you know, incentives that can be provided by ASEAN. Third, uh, ASEAN uh, is relevant because ASEAN providing the working principle for the construction of a regional security architecture that is good for peace and stability for all of the countries, including countries like Russia, uh, the US, China, Japan, South Korea. Um, ASEAN is providing building blocks for that uh, process, you know, for, for the involving security, security architecture of the region. And, uh, and ASEAN is playing constructive roles in that process uh, by, for example, uh, becoming an honest broker, a connector, or a convener uh, for uh, other stakeholders in the region uh, to come to discuss the issues of their concern. The East Asia Summit, for example, you know, provides uh, the venue for regional leaders to come and talk strategic issues. And, you know, we don't have any other alternative to the East Asia Summit, you know, uh, in, in, for, for that reason. Um, and uh, ASEAN is also trying to develop a vision for itself and a vision for uh, regional cooperation. So I would like to share this with you, that ASEAN is now working on the post-2025 vision. And let's see what, uh, that, what will be included uh, in that vision. But that vision is, um, is the one that, that ASEAN is working hard uh, on it right now. Um, so this is an organization that has a vision uh, to follow and, and not just to respond to uh, short-term issues. I, another example of the ASEAN role is the ASEAN contributing to global public goods and the case of ASEAN participation in PKO uh, is a vivid example of that ability of ASEAN uh, to give a helping hand to global governance you know, so you can see uh, that 10 ASEAN countries have endorsed the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative uh, under the auspices of the United Nations. So that is one thing that ASEAN can do uh, and do it very well. Uh, for example, Vietnam is now becoming a lot more active uh, in, the, in the PKO operations, you know, from sending troops uh, to having officers uh, being admitted to work at the UN headquarters, you know, uh, in the PKO offices of the UN. Uh, another example of ASEAN's um, viability, ASEAN uh, relevancy is the, you know, for example, under the chairmanship of Vietnam uh, last year, you know, during the chairmanship of Vietnam, um, ASEAN uh, demonstrated that ASEAN is not just being able to respond uh, to uh, emerging issues, but also uh, working on longer term uh, projects and programs, such as community building uh, and um, you know, working with 
ASEAN partners. So with all of this uh, reason, I think, uh, let me uh, move to another example of ASEAN relevancy, uh, Russia and ASEAN. You know, Russia is now ASEAN strategic partner. And, uh, the, you know, there are still a lot of countries that want to become ASEAN partner. And the list is long. And ASEAN is pretty picky about who can become ASEAN partners. So we often have um, a backlog of countries applying for uh, the status of ASEAN partnership. So every year, uh, ASEAN um, gives the chance to a few countries to become ASEAN partners. But for the case of Russia, uh, from early on, you know, Russia had become ASEAN strategic partner and uh, with a lot of areas of cooperation. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the potential is still there for, for both sides to tap into, uh, but at least we have a very stable, uh, a very high level framework uh, between uh, the two sides to deepen cooperation. Uh, so that is another example of ASEAN relevancy. ASEAN is not relevant, relevant if no one comes to ASEAN, right? But what I'm trying to say is people keep going to ASEAN. In conclusion, I think ASEAN is relevant and uh, I haven't seen any other robust alternatives, uh, you know, um, with great power competition, um, if there is a China-led institutional arrangement that will face some backlash from the United States. And if there is an US-led institutional arrangement, then there would be a backlash from China. But ASEAN is neutral. ASEAN tried to provide you know, the venues as an honest broker, as a connector between the stakeholders. Uh, in the region. So for that reason, I think ASEAN, um, you know, has a logic uh, to be there. And I also want to mention the fact that ASEAN is slow, but ASEAN gets things done. Don't look at the way that ASEAN is handling crises, like the one in Myanmar right now, or in or, or the pandemic, and to come to the conclusion that ASEAN is unable uh, you know, to handle uh, any issue or ASEAN is now, uh, you know, is diminishing because it's unable to provide solution to a lot of problems. Who can provide solution to those issues? Uh, so that is my, my point, you know, so we are slow. Please be patient with us. We're going to get things done. But another point that I'd like to uh, mention here is, you know, any role by ASEAN, whether that is central role or mediation or honest broker or connector, that role shouldn't be taken for granted. You know, all of these uh, roles have to be earned. ASEAN has to work very hard, you know, to live up to the expectation uh, of the, its own people, of the member states and partners. You know, so it's, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work in progress, you know, it's a process based rather than the, an outcome based in, in many circumstances. And finally, um, we have to, of course, manage our expectation. I give you last one example. When the dispute in the East Sea happens, the South China Sea, there are a lot of people uh, coming to me and ask why ASEAN is, why ASEAN failed to provide a solution to the dispute in the East Sea, in the South China Sea. So what I try, I try to explain to the people who ask me that question, that ASEAN is not designed to solve dispute. Okay, ASEAN is not designed as a dispute settlement mechanism. ASEAN provide the venues and the tools to settle differences, but ASEAN itself 
is not a dispute settlement mechanism. So, uh, so we have to manage our expectation, you know, and understand ASEAN right and understand ASEAN correctly. Uh, but, um, you know, the thing that I think ASEAN, why ASEAN is still viable, because ASEAN is open, it's open to ideas, it's open to partnership. So with that, um, I think uh, ASEAN future is still bright, despite all the challenges that I described earlier. Um, I think I should stop here. I, I would like to uh, yield my uh, time here for Q&A and for uh, interaction with the audience. Thank you very much for your attention and um, look forward to the uh, question from the, uh, from the audience. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yep. Um, we really, we are really thankful to you for an interesting lecture. And uh, we are now moving to the Q&A session. Please, uh, dear participants, uh, present here and uh, in Zoom meeting, uh, you are now able to ask your questions, if any, and uh, commentaries. Uh, so please indicate your wish to ask a question to speaker. But uh, I think we will start with some presented questions because we have <laughs> quite a number of them. And um, as I know, uh, one of the participants who sent it as his question beforehand is uh, now here. Uh, please, Gabriel Onrada from the Philippines, uh, studying in Rudan University. You can ask your question. Please turn, uh -huh. turn on your mic. So we okay, can hear okay. you. Hello, good day, everybody. Is everything, everything working? Everything clear? Yeah. Yes. Uh, hello. Good morning, uh, Professor Tin. Good morning. Also, I would like to ask my question direct to the point. So, um, how can ASEAN's values be reinvented in uh, today's uh, sophisticated and complex world? So, uh, my my premise is, an organization is just as strong as its values, just like any religion. Uh, the religion is strong because its values are strong. They endure despite the changes in the world they exist in. Um, and, and because of this, even if uh, challenges are presented against these values, these values are interpreted and reinterpreted in, in, it, in a way it proves just how strong this religion is. And I think the same premise applies with ASEAN. Uh, if ASEAN, how, and my question is, how can ASEAN reinvent its norms, as you said, in uh, today's uh, complex uh, world uh, marked by your presentation, this geopolitical uh, uh, great power competition, uh, digitalization and megatrends, so on and so forth. My question focuses on values. The professor gave us a very strong discussion about interests, economic interests, national interests, great power interests, and it only forms part of what ASEAN is. But in my view, values still matter because without values, ASEAN will just become a money-making organization. That's it. Without values, you just fall into profiteering. And that's my question. Thank you very much, Professor. So should I respond to the question or I... Yeah, yeah, directly. Okay, okay. thanks. Thanks very much, Gabriel. And um, uh, it's a very valid question, you know, um, and I, I, I welcome that. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I'm unable to describe uh, all of the things that ASEAN is standing for, uh, but absolutely that values are a key uh, component of what ASEAN is and what ASEAN is doing. Um, values such as peace, um, stability, uh, human security, um, you know, cultural values, uh, social cohesion, uh, all of these, you know, values uh, make up for, uh, you know, uh, the contemporary Asia. Uh, and it's still, like I mentioned, it's still work in progress as well. You know, there are certain values uh, and goals that we are working on right now. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, for example, uh, to turn ASEAN into a uh, an association of, um, uh, you know, for example, human index development, you know, joining the, you know, the top tier countries in terms of human index development, for example. So those are the goals that ASEAN uh, has set for itself. Uh, but yeah, again, but I agree with you that um, the moment that we give up our narrative uh, on, on values, the values of values, <laughs> the moment that ASEAN will be in question, right? We are not just interest driven, we are also value driven. So, so, so I completely, I'm completely on the same page with you on that. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the audience for now? Okay, then uh, we'll pass to another question from uh, from Anna Kilme uh, from the Philippines as well. And she's asking uh, how can Vietnam balance uh, the effect of major powers, not like uh, ASEAN as an organization, but Vietnam uh, as a country. Thank you. Um, in my personal perspective, uh, Vietnam is not balancing between major powers. Vietnam is developing balanced relations with major powers, <laughs> which is different, right? We are not in a balancing game. The game that Vietnam is trying to play is the game of independence and, and self-reliance. So we are not ganging up on any other country to balance against another country. Okay, we are not in any, uh, you know, balancing, um, you know, uh, uh, calculation per se. You know, we 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 try to be, um, uh, you know, uh, we try to develop healthy relationships with all major powers, and um, but, you know, what we want to fall back on is not any of them. But the thing that we fall back on is ourselves. So by the, by the end of the day, Vietnam will be on our own. Uh, we want to make the decision ourselves. Uh, we try to uh, maintain the self-reliance, the strategic autonomy uh, in decision making and in handling international relations. Um, but I got your point. I got your point. You know, there are a lot of... Um, you know, uh, policy choices adopted by ASEAN member countries uh, today and, and, you know, small and medium-sized countries in general between major powers. You know, some opt for a bandwagoning strategy, some opt for, you know, a uh, uh, balancing, uh, you, know, you know, strategy, uh, but the majority of them will, you know, uh, Adopt uh, what I you know what is called a hedging strategy, you know hedging between major powers. So I I don't think Vietnam is none of that. <laughs> Vietnam is trying to be a little bit more uh, I don't I you know uh, different, a little bit different, you know by uh, really emphasizing the importance of being independent. We have uh, we have had historical lessons before of not uh, retaining our uh, independent posture between major powers. And that did not work very well for Vietnam. So, you know, we learned that lesson by today trying to develop cooperative, constructive and healthy uh, relationship with all major powers. Thank you very much for your opinion. Um, in that regard, um, as you mentioned the role of Russia in the region, uh, I would like to ask on behalf of uh, Dr. Anna Kireva, who is not present, unfortunately, but she would like to ask uh, her question to you uh, about uh, uh, the possible triangle, like 
uh, between Russia, ASEAN, maybe Vietnam in particular, and Japan. Uh, is it possible, in your opinion, this configuration? ASEAN, Russia, Japan? Yeah. Possible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, because I'm a scholar, right? So I try to be a little bit creative here. You know, um, you know, our, you know the the uh, the the limit for our our imagination is the sky, right? There's no limit. Uh, but to be very honest, I think uh, trilateral cooperation uh, works. Uh, you know, in many occasions, um, and uh, trilateral cooperation is even more effective than other forms of multilateral cooperation. And um, there are two basic reasons why I say ASEAN, Japan, and Russia cooperation is possible. Reason number one, trilateral cooperation is feasible and attractive because trilateral cooperation is very much problem solving. Trilateral cooperation often focus, focuses on very practical issues and solving, right? So it's very tempting to be in certain arrangement versus a you know, grand scale kind of uh, multilateral arrangement uh, with a lot of you know, priorities, a uh, lot of issues uh, on the agenda but not working very effectively. So that is the reason why a lot of countries today, they prefer a smaller scale multilateralism, you know, including uh, trilateral cooperation, or some people say minilateral. So the first uh, reason is, um, is, is it's more effective you know, under certain circumstances. And the second reason is because the number of participants is small. So it's easier uh, for them to work with one another, you know, versus like, you know, if you go to a big organization and if that organization is, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, regulated by principles such as consensus, it's more difficult to get um, a, 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 a go ahead kind of thing from, from member countries versus the trilateral cooperation uh, which is uh, arranged in a way that the participants can talk to each other uh, more conveniently, more comfortably. So for that two theoretical reasons, I think trilateral cooperation is possible. Um, when it comes to the ASEAN, Russia and uh, Japan uh, possible cooperation, uh, I also think it's possible because the three sides uh, have a lot of things to offer to each other, right? Uh, Japan, uh, for example, uh, financial capability, Russia, technological capability, and Viet Vietnam, human resource capability, for example. So we can combine and based on our comparative advantage, uh, we can develop common agenda and drive them forward. Uh, you know, so for for those reasons, I think it's quite it's impossible. And uh, and let's think about it. Let's let think about it seriously. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions uh, as for now? Okay, then uh, I would like to pass the floor to Miss uh, Yulia Rachinska, uh, a PhD student here in Gimo, to ask her a question. Please turn on your mic. So, yes, hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Thank good you so afternoon. much. Good afternoon. <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Thank you so much for your enlightening presentation. It was very interesting, very new concept. Um, so, I would like to ask about the role of civil society for ASEAN, because it's one of the issues that was uh, highly disputed within the existing uh, literature. And um, so there, there were periods when 
after the financial ASEAN, uh, ASEAN financial crisis, the role of civil society became uh, stronger. And uh, I'm wondering what is the position of ASEAN right now in this situation that you describe as, uh, uh, as between the two uh, superpowers? How exactly civil society will be incorporated into this process? Thank you. Thanks, Julia. It's a, it's a very, that's a very tough question. Um, uh, both the ASEAN leaders and, and, and ASEAN lovers like me uh, would find it hard to respond to your question. Uh, but there's one thing that I know for sure that uh, the CSO is, uh, is increasingly becoming a priority for, uh, for ASEAN. Because ASEAN community building, ASEAN community building process uh, is uh, multifaceted, and uh, and uh, it's a multi-stakeholder process, right? So, uh, I think ASEAN government uh, uh, include uh, you know different you know, stakeholders uh, in each society of the member states country to involve. In the uh, in in the you know building of the ASEAN community and in uh, economic, social, economic, uh, and political agendas, um, I think ASEAN have uh, member countries have uh, make a lot of efforts in uh, you know uh, making ASEAN known to the to the to the public. And uh, you know to raise awareness, um, you know among uh, its own people. Uh, for example, uh, ASEAN in many ASEAN countries right now, um, there are television programs uh, talking about ASEAN and um, what ASEAN is doing. Because ironically, um, there are a lot of people within ASEAN uh, countries. Uh, don't know, uh, you know what exactly ASEAN is doing, you know. So, um, so the civil society, you know, uh, different actors, the business community, the youth, uh, you know, uh, all of these uh, uh, groups in the society definitely have a role to play by, you know, helping ASEAN governments to raise awareness about the association, about the um, programs and projects and goals and blueprints and master plans and whatever the uh, association association um, is working on. You know, we need um, people to help. You know, to carry the message further and deeper. Uh, so that is only one example of the role that different actors uh, can get involved in the process. Um, and um, Yulia, you might know that ASEAN has the uh, uh, social cultural pillar, right? So under that pillar, I think the uh, different groups uh, in, in the society can have roles to play. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the development philosophy of ASEAN is inclusive development, right? Sustainable, inclusive development. So we don't want to leave anyone behind or we don't want to exclude anyone in that process. Uh, but, you know, uh, in reality, uh, it's, it's more challenging uh, because it takes time for, for ASEAN uh, to become uh, more successful uh, in that comprehensive term. So, so, you know, despite the fact that ASEAN is trying, trying to uh, get people involved, but you know, uh, I think more work needs to be done. I don't know whether that responds to your question. <laughs> Definitely, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question. Please uh, introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, my name is Ekaterina Kozlova and I'm a student of the Faculty of International Relations. First of all, I would like to thank you for a very interesting lecture. And my question is 
following one. Actually, there is a very contradictable statement that all the empires eventually collapse. And talking about international organizations, we should admit that these organizations experience crises. They have to overcome different hurdles, obstacles, in order to finally find a compromise. In your opinion, the Asian as an international organization should take what measures in order to remain a, a strong international, um, international organization with lasting eternal values, pursuing long-term goals, and what steps should be taken in order to maintain the balance, which is very fragile, by the way, in our sophisticated world. Thanks in advance for your answer. Thank you. Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, I guess um, there is a lot of going on in the minds of ASEAN leaders right now about which direction they want ASEAN to embark on. Um, of course, we have the vision out there. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the uh, uh, timeline for community building. We have all of these, you know, things uh, available to us. Uh, but, you know, like my uh, a colleague from the Philippines mentioned earlier, that uh, we cannot take anything for granted and ASEAN is like similar to any other organization or entity. Uh, we need to reinvent ourselves constantly, um, you know, to be adaptive to the changing circumstances, uh, whether that is major power competition or, you know, the pandemic which is unfolding right now. So reinventing ourselves is a, is a must. So, more specifically, I think there are a couple of things that I think ASEAN should do uh, to make itself uh, more relevant, uh, more responsive uh, to the new circumstances. One, uh, ASEAN needs to uh, think uh, through the working principles uh, that you know, uh, make ASEAN ASEAN. <laughs> Uh, for the last five decades, and of which the most important principle, working, working principle is consensus, right? So consensus make ASEAN ASEAN. But uh, to be very frank, consensus sometimes slows ASEAN down. You know, why the world is changing so fast and you are making your decisions uh, that slowly, you know, and that these two things just do not match. Um, so what we should what what should we do about it? Um, you know, um, to my understanding, ASEAN government uh, recently, um, you know, they uh, decided that they can be a little a little bit more flexible uh, when it comes to the consensus uh, working principle. For example, um, in trade negotiation, trade a hundred percent. Unanimous, okay? So in ASEAN trade arrangement, what we need is majority voting. We don't need consensus. That's one example. Second example is um, in some of the recent joint statements by ASEAN, we have a things like this. We have a thing like some of the ministers express concern about certain things. You know, we, we no longer adopt the formula of ministers or all ministers. We are okay with the formula. Some of the ministers express their concern about certain things. So that is another example of our higher degree of flexibility when it comes to consensus working principle. So one is to uh, work on our working principle. Second, ASEAN needs to be more effective, right? There is a lot of bureaucracy in ASEAN. There are 1,200 meetings per year in ASEAN. You know, can you imagine? Can you go to all the meetings of ASEAN? By the time I'm speaking to you, there are three meetings of ASEAN going on right now. So we have a lot of bureaucracy. Um, so we need to streamline the process. That is the second thing. We need to make ASEAN more seamless and more nimble, you know? Um, and not just in 
in, in the bureaucracy of the organization, but also in the uh, cooperative programs within ASEAN and between ASEAN and partners. For example, one, one stop, uh, a single window custom, for example, you know, to streamline, to simplify, uh, to make the process and the experience um, smoother for the ASEAN people and partners. So that is the second thing. And third, we need help. <laughs> we need help from more capable partners uh, just to make ASEAN stronger, right? We cannot do anything in a vacuum. We need help. We need cooperation from the international partners. So we can together, you know, we, um, we are stronger together. Fourth, uh, no matter what happened, ASEAN has to be united. ASEAN has to be one single family. If, if different members, countries of ASEAN is going in different direction, then is ASEAN going to be gone? Okay, so that's why we always call upon the member states of ASEAN uh, to embrace unity in diversity. Okay, even though we are diverse, we are different, but we need to be united. So, and, and finally, um, it's important for ASEAN, like I mentioned earlier, for an organization to be relevant, uh, we need to work hard. We need to select the right uh, issue on the agenda, and we need to make sure that our agenda is translated into reality. Uh, you know, if we get things, uh, too many things undone, then our reputation will be damaged. So um, it takes a lot of effort and will uh, for ASEAN uh, you know, to be there and as a, an, a regional organization. But historically, you know, uh, we are still the most successful regional organization so far. 54 something years old and, and still counting. Okay, um, the last two questions come from the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Uh, and uh, I would like to pass the floor to Chung Le to ask his question. Please turn on your mic. Um, hello, Dr. Ting. Could you hear me Hi. clearly? Yes. Um, yes, so um, um, as, far, as far as I know that now, uh, there's no Asian country can produce va COVID-19 vaccine. So, and uh, Vietnam is on the final stages to uh, produce this vaccine. So uh, when our vaccine uh, is adopted by um, the WHO, um, will Vietnam use uh, our vaccine to build our international influence on uh, other countries or we just produce to meet our domestic goal demand. Thank you. Thank you, Jung. Um, I'm not the Minister of Health, unfortunately, so uh, I don't know the details of the vaccine uh, production uh, by Vietnam. I think the name is Nanocovax. Uh, there are two or three different types of vaccines uh, are being developed in Vietnam. And Vietnam have, uh, has joined the rank of uh, the group of about 30, 35 countries in the world that uh, can produce vaccine. So the, the vaccines, uh, uh, you know, uh, potentially produced by Vietnam, uh, Vietnam is now in the clinical clinic trial or, you know, whatever stage, in the very final stage, um, to be uh, adopted by the Ministry of Health um, uh, for use. Um, so I don't know all the technical aspects of, of that uh, process, uh, but uh, if Vietnam, uh, you know, imagine that Vietnam is able to uh, have our own vaccine, I, I believe that Vietnam will, uh, first of all, uh, you know, use that vaccine for domestic use, uh, for the prevention of, of the COVID-19 pandemic at home first. And then if the capability allows Vietnam, 
uh, to go beyond uh, our comfort zone and um, to reach out to the international community. I strongly believe that Vietnam will uh, come of age to ASEAN peers countries, um, you know, by, you know, whether I don't know, donating or via commercial channels uh, to make the vaccines available uh, to ASEAN member countries. And, and remember that Vietnam is also a, a great benefactor of the COVAX uh, program um, administered by UNICEF, uh, the United Nations, and Vietnam has donated $500,000 uh, to COVAX. So if Vietnam you know, is able to produce the Vietnamese version of the COVID-19 vaccines, I also believe that Vietnam will donate uh, Vietnam's vaccine to the COVAX program. Uh, you know, if the ability of production allows Vietnam to do so. Thank you very much. And the concluding question comes from Suan Mai. Suan Mai, uh, please turn on your mic as well. Suan Mai, are you here with us? Um, so, hello everyone. Can you guys Hi. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, so, first of all, I will introduce myself. Sure. Oh, my name is Sun Mai, and I am a freshman from Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Um, and as far as I know, I know that one of the Russian main foreign affair is strengthening its position in Asia. So can you clarify in which expert Russia had cooperated with ASEAN during the COVID-19 period and help ASEAN member deal, deal with their serious COVID-19 problem. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you. Um, I think it's more, uh, I would do uh, more justice by inviting my uh, Russian friends to respond to this question. Uh, but I will give my, uh, my take uh, first, and then maybe our Russian colleagues uh, might want to join me in answering uh, your interesting question. So ASEAN uh, and Russia are strategic partners. And um, by strategic partners, uh, I mean, and we mean, and ASEAN mean, and Russia means, that um, we need to collaborate each other with each other more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, intimately, you know, you know, closely, uh, whether that is economic cooperation or security cooperation. So uh, I don't have the numbers uh, to share with you how much or how many uh, vaccines doses that, that Russia has given to Asian countries. But I think, uh, but you know, to my understanding, uh, Russia is you know reaching out uh, to help many of the Asian countries uh, in the fight against COVID uh, by uh, sharing experiences, uh, donating or selling uh, vaccines, Sputnik V, uh, to to them, uh, or uh, you know adopting and adopting uh, other measures just to make sure that uh, rational relationship with those Asian countries to be continued and not to be disrupted uh, by the pandemic. Uh, let's take the Russia vietnam relationship as an example. Uh, as far as I know, that during the pandemic in the last two years, there have been a lot of uh, high level exchanges uh, between Russia and Vietnam. And the two countries leaders have been on regular uh, phone call to each other. And um, much of the talk I think is about how the two sides can work together uh, to respond uh, to the pandemic. Uh, 
but like I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, there is still a lot of potential uh, that need to be uh, that we need to leverage on uh, to make Russia uh, ASEAN, Russia Vietnam, Russia Asia Pacific relations uh, more robust, you know, more effective uh, to meet the expectations of the two sides. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, there is not much to add, actually. Uh, your answer was quite full. Uh, the only thing I can mention is that uh, the Sputnik V vaccine, the Russia-produced vaccine, is now uh, produced in Vietnam as well. And there are many other uh, aspects of bilateral cooperation between Russia and ASEAN countries in vaccine production and other uh, health issues and so on. But uh, as we are running out of time, I think we should stop here for the moment. And uh, we thank you very much, Dr. Lev, uh, for your inspiring and interesting lecture. I wish you can come one day in person here to the Gimo University and we all will welcome you uh, as warmly as now. Uh, so thank you very much once again. Thank you all the uh, participants uh, who managed to come here to Gimo University and who joined us virtually. Um, we will stop here and uh, till the next ASEAN Academic Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, you know, again, it's my pleasure and privilege to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this position, even though that it was too early, uh, to speak to you and to talk to uh, the colleagues and the uh, faculties and the students of the MGMO. And it's a very prestigious, very well-known institution here in Vietnam and globally. So it's, it's an honor for me. And I really enjoy the discussion. I can talk about ASEAN for days. And, and absolutely, I also feel very uh, flattered by what you say and uh, by uh, you know, listening to a lot things from the audience. So, um, so for me, it's a, it's a terrific experience. Thank you very much and hope to see you again in person. Thank you. Thank you.